Many of you wanted to see the Cairo 2, and it was such a close race between the Voodoo 3 and the Cairo, but in the end, the 3DFX advocates were a little bit more. So, we are going to have a look at this Voodoo 3 2000 today. You may have seen it already in one of my other videos. This card was mutilated by someone with a sharp object, probably to get the heatsink off. I am not sure about the reasoning why someone would do such a thing, but now we are left with a non-working Voodoo card. Anyway, I will try my luck repairing this iconic graphics card today. But first, we need to get the heatsink off, using a proper method without damaging the chip underneath further. I have seen many methods online, and the nicest in my opinion is the one where you slip a knife between the chip and the heatsink for support, and then use a screwdriver to remove it. Unfortunately, at room temperature, I felt quite uncomfortable squeezing the screwdriver between the knife and the heatsink. The glue or cement used on those cards is very strong, and some users suggested to freeze the card before attempting to get the heatsink off. So, I left the card in the freezer overnight. The next morning, I tried again. I don't know if it helped, but at this point there was no turning back. The heatsink had to come off. And with one more uncomfortable push against the aluminum heatsink, it snapped off leaving behind a large blob of glue that doesn't look like the best thermal compound 3DFX could have put on their chips. I spent about 30 minutes to get the remains off the chip using a razor blade. Unfortunately, in the process of cracking the glue piece by piece, I did scratch the surface of the chip, but I couldn't think of any better method to remove whatever this is. Now we can properly inspect the damage on the substrate. The bottom right corner of the chip seems to have been damaged as well. You can see several cracks in the substrate, but there is only one wire that is located in the damaged area. I tested the continuity of this trace to the wire and to the pad underneath the chip. The multimeter confirmed that the connection is still intact. Which is a bit surprising, but I'm happy that we don't have to work on this corner of the chip. Unfortunately, the bottom left corner looks a lot worse. This is the result of a careless, quick and mindless action. The PCB cracked through all layers. Luckily, this seems to be a simple substrate with just one top and one bottom layer. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so before I remove the chip, I will try to repair it from the top. As you have hopefully read in the title, this is my first attempt of fixing a BGA chip, so any advice or tips are welcome. And please do not use my approach as a guide on how to do this correctly, I am not an expert and I am still learning. But if you do want to work with experts, then you should check out PCBWay, the sponsor of today's video. PCBWay is one of the leading companies in PCB fabrication. With state-of-the-art manufacturing capabilities, PCBWay offers fast turnaround times and competitive pricing, making them the go-to choice for hobbyists and professionals alike. You can also take advantage of their comprehensive PCB assembly services to streamline your production process and bring your designs to the market faster. Soon, you will see a new little project on my channel that may help you in some of your retro computing endeavors, and you will be able to get the fully assembled PCB from PCBWay. So, stay tuned for that, and visit PCBWay.com to see their other services. Links are in the video description. Now that pieces of the cracked surface have been removed, I have a clear view of the copper traces. And it doesn't look good. You may not be able to see it properly on the screen, but the traces are cracked right before they connect to the wire. So let me try to run two wires to fix those two connections. And then, let's try the card. Maybe we are lucky enough and we get a picture. Oh, I also noticed some scratches below the chip on the PCB. However, I don't think there is any damage in this area. Just the solder mask got a bit scratched. Before we can test the card, I went over it to see if there were any other issues. And there were plenty. There were some solder bridges on one of the memory chips which had to be fixed. This is usually an indicator that someone else was here with a soldering iron. This suspicion is reinforced by the residue of flux around some SMD components and other memory chips. 
I wonder what has happened to this card since there are also some capacitors and resistors missing. This is so weird. Maybe this card served as a donor? Or were they just knocked off? But then I would expect more damage to the board. Whatever the reason, we have to get all those resistors and capacitors back on the board. I tried to get the correct values from high resolution pictures or by measuring similar looking components and clusters nearby. And once I was confident that the card was ready to be tested, I plugged it into my ASUS P3BF for the first test. <laughs> I guess this would have been way too easy if this was all that was needed. So, it is time to get the chip off and look for more damage underneath. As I said before, this is my first attempt to work on a BGA chip. And although I did practice on a similar looking chip, to which we come in a moment, I am by far not too confident in my abilities. However, I did research on how to perform such a repair, how to avoid popcorning and so on. But all of this is too extensive to explain in this video. So, let's get right into it. I used a PCB preheater set to 120 degrees, covered some of the electrolytic capacitors with foil, which I replaced later on anyway, and blasted hot air at the chip. Unfortunately, I have only a cheap hot air station, which I plan to replace soon. I removed the nozzle because the hot air station would be too weak otherwise. Believe me, I have tested this before on a different chip to practice. After 5 minutes of blasting hot air on it, I thought it had some sort of glue or underfill because it didn't move at all. So, I used brute force to look at what was underneath my test chip, only to realize that there was… nothing, just regular solder. This was the moment when I realized that I need a better hot air station. I am thinking of an Aten 862D, but if you have any other suggestions, please let me know in the comments. I am aware of the Quick 861, but based on Louis Rossmann, both hot air stations are more or less the same, with the Aten being around 100 US dollars cheaper. But let's get back to our Voodoo 3 now. I increased the PCB preheater to 140 degrees, blasted the card additionally from the back with hot air, right before giving it the final heat shock from the top. And finally, the chip moved and I could remove it from the card. In the process, I did remove some SMD components, which I put back in place off camera. Now I will remove the solder from both, the card and the chip, so we can have a clear look at what is going on and maybe uncover some additional damage that was hidden below the chip. Once I was done cleaning the chip, I decided to go over the pads to test their ability to accept fresh solder. Most of the pads in the four rows surrounding the chip were okay. However, once I moved to the center pads, I noticed that some looked dull and didn't accept fresh solder easily. Only after several attempts, the pads accepted the solder. Some did only partially and were only completely covered after scrubbing over them multiple times with a hot soldering iron. But in the end, all the pads were covered. Let's have a quick look at the damage we have seen on the card itself. Luckily, there were no broken traces. All there was to do was to use some fresh solder mask to cover the exposed copper. I also fixed any other potential issues like scratched traces and solder filled wires, basically anything that could cause issues when resoldering the chip. Once the card was taken care of, I could focus on the chip. And here we can see that the damage was not only located on the top side. With my engraving pen, I removed part of the solder mask to get a better look at the copper traces and the wires. And as you can see, this one trace is no longer connected to its wire. It easily lifts and we can see the severed wire below. So we have to reattach those traces and rebuild all connections. Because this is such a delicate area, I decided to reinforce this trace with a wire, which I'm routing around the edge of the chip to the front. I just don't trust this connection anymore. Next, we have to reball the chip. 
you have probably seen people using a stencil to get those balls back on the chip. Unfortunately, I do not have a suitable stencil and I was stuck to manually align the countless solder balls, which are 0.6mm in diameter. After 20 minutes, I was happy that every ball was in place and hot air, at the lowest airflow, hit the chip. And much to my dismay, I had to watch all solder balls floating around and migrating towards each other. So what did I do wrong? Well, I had too much flux on my chip. There was really no reason for me to continue. All I could do was to start over, but this time with a lot less flux. I'm really proud of my first reballed chip. Now we just have to put it back on the card. I added a little bit of flux and distributed it with my finger evenly across all pads. Then it was time for the chip to go back on the card. The goal is to realign the solder balls with the pads on the board. Luckily, the board has an outline of where the chip is supposed to be. Once more I used the PCB preheater and when the card reached temperature I started to blow hot air on the chip and waited until the chip moved into place. This took a lot longer than I thought. Again, I really wonder what's the difference with a more powerful hot air station. But at some point the chip did move and I gave it the little push on one side to see it move and go back into position. Unfortunately, I do not have this on camera because I wanted to focus on the chip's placement and that required all my attention. Once I was done, the card needed to cool down for about 5 minutes. And now we have a fully reassembled card. Here you can see the solder balls making a connection to their respective pads. Unfortunately, I may have used solder balls that are too small. Instead of having a round shape, mine look more like columns. Next time I'd rather take 0.65 or 0.7mm solder balls. Nevertheless, I'm very happy that I went through the entire process of removing, reballing and resoldering a BGA chip. The question is however, does this Voodoo 3 work now? Ugh, <sighs> it was a long shot anyway. The card doesn't work. So what could be the possible cause for the card not to work? Well, there are plenty and some may have been caused by myself. First, I could have killed the chip with excessive heat. And although I don't want this to be true, the possibility is high. Did you see the discoloration on the underside of the chip? Maybe I just had too much heat going too fast on the chip when I tried to remove it. Other possibilities include that some solder balls did not make a proper connection to the board. Or there are still some traces that are broken which I haven't noticed. It could also be that part of my repair was undone while reattaching the chip to the board. Of course, there could also be other issues on this board because I suspect someone else has been working on it before. And finally, the BIOS could be faulty. But I did address this and reflashed the chip and even soldered a socket to the board. But the card still did not work after that, even though the BIOS on this card had a few bits different compared to the BIOS I downloaded from the web. All I can say is that I tried my very best to save this Voodoo 3. Unfortunately, I could not. Maybe one day I will find a Voodoo 3 with a severely broken PCB and I can have another go with a PCB of this card. But for now, I will put it away. And of course, please let me know in the comments what I can do better in the future. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.